это они не настоящие. Это шкуры. Ух ты. Ты пришла чего? Экскурсию смотреть? Мы попали на лекцию в музее. А тема лекции какая? Ну, короче, на входе написано, что здесь можно зверушек потрогать руками. Мы сели в первый ряд, поэтому, скорее всего, первые потрогаем. Ты на краешке сидишь? Ну, я тоже. Мы ждем, когда заполнится весь зал. Зальчик тут такой небольшой. Ну, куда еще? Куда еще? Сквиз. Я не хочу сквиз. I don't want squeeze. Moist or else 
they'll die. If they dry out, they die. So toads that you think of as living on the forest floor will actually gather rainwater and hold it inside of their body so they don't dry out. Most other salamanders are frogs. I mean, most of other amphibians are frogs and our salamanders are usually very closely tied to a water source. Did I see a hand up for a question somewhere? Yeah. Um, also, um, worms need to... Worms do too, yeah, but worms are not an amphibian, but you're right, absolutely. They, they can't dry out either, else they'll die. In fact, you see them dried up on sidewalks. Now, we happen to be here in North Carolina, the salamander capital of the world. And that means we have about 60 species, maybe more, maybe more like 61, 62 species or types of salamanders right here in our state. And that is more salamanders, types of salamanders, than any other place in the world that's comparable in size to our state. So we have a lot of salamanders here in North Carolina. And most of them are found in our mountain region where it's nice and cool and very wet. A big part of our mountain region is called a temperate rainforest because it's temperate in that it's not tropical, it's not too hot, but instead it's nice and cool and it stays very, very wet. And that's exactly the habitat that salamanders love and thrive in. Now, not to say we don't have salamanders across our entire state. We actually do all the way through to the coastal plains. Um, they do need fresh water though, so they're not gonna be found in salty or brackish water. Now, you notice I put on a glove and that's because we're just protecting our amphibians that live here at the museum. Their skin is like a sponge, so anything that might be on our hands, whether it's just our natural body oils or salts or lotions or bug spray or sunscreen, any of that stuff can actually be harmful to the amphibian. So we always touch them or handle them with a glove on, and I'm actually not gonna bring this one around to touch, but I'll just bring it around for you all to look at, okay? And they do like to stay buried. It's just in simply some wet or moist moss. It's called sphagnum moss. So we're just gonna look at this one, not touch since it is one of our amphibians. This one is a spotted salamander. And spotted salamanders can be found right here in the Raleigh area, through the Piedmont and into the mountains. Not so much in the coastal plains, either. they're pretty adorable. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes. I know the new skill. Alright, did everyone see him? I didn't miss any one of my middle rows, did I? I tend to miss those middle rows sometimes. You guys just let me know if I do. So that's our salamander, and again, a salamander is an amphibian, along with frogs and toads, and they all start their life in or very, very close to water, okay? Most salamanders will, will hatch out of eggs in the water. Some, there's a few, where they'll lay it on land, but in a very, very, very wet place. Now our other amphibian that we're gonna see today is a type of toad. Now toad eggs are typically laid in the water in these long strands like you see here, unlike that salamander egg mass that was like a big jelly mass of eggs. Toads are more likely laid in a string, but again, still in the water. And those little babies that hatch out are gonna be called tadpoles. And toad tadpoles, now when we think of a toad, a toad is one that typically will grow up to live on land, usually on the forest floor. And so toads are more land dwelling rather than water dwelling. So they don't stay in the tadpole stage typically for very long. They stay pretty small, then they'll grow in those legs and make their way onto land. They're usually pretty tiny when they, they come out and emerge up onto the land, and then they finish doing their growing or their, their developing up on land, since that's where they're gonna be ultimately. And here's a cane toad. Now toads have that warty, bumpy skin that you see here but toads do not give us warts. So even though they have warty, bumpy skin, we don't get warts from toads, okay? That's a different thing, some type of virus. I'm not gonna talk about that in here. And so, but one of the cool things that they have right here behind the eye is a big poison gland called the parotid gland. And so should a predator, like let's say a dog or something, catch a toad in its mouth, it can ooze out those toxins likely is not gonna kill the dog, at least our North Carolina species won't, but the dog is gonna remember that 
nasty taste. It's pretty foul tasting apparently <laughs> and spit it out and then our little toad can hop away and get away from the, the dog. So the next amphibian I have is a cane toad. Now cane toads are not native to North Carolina. They're not native to actually most of North America. They are South America. Now the cane toad was introduced to, because they're normally called a marine toad, which marine usually we think of as salt water. They're not around salt water, okay? So I don't know why they're called marine toad, but they get their name cane toad because a long time ago, Australia was having a problem with a cane beetle eating their sugar cane crop. And so they imported these giant toads to Australia. And this was a very bad decision because now they are highly invasive to this day in Australia. And there's a big problem with cane toads in Australia. Because they're not normally there, and they're not native there, they became invasive. And did they eat the cane beetle? No, not really. Because if you think of stalks of, of sugar cane, the cane beetle, is up here on the stalks of the sugar cane. Where is the cane toad? Down on the ground. Yeah, so unless there's a, a beetle on the ground, the cane toad's not exactly gonna be able to get the beetles. And so they have wreaked havoc in Australia. Like I said, just even to this day. They're highly um, toxic to other animals, to the native species there. Because of their size and they're not picky eaters, they'll eat just about anything they can fit in their mouths, um, besides, you know, besides cane beetles. Um, and because of that, they are invasive there. So you never, ever, ever want to release a pet that you may have out into the wild because it could possibly potentially become an invasive species. Florida has a big problem with a lot of invasive species down there from pets that have been released into the environment. So you definitely don't ever want to do that. Should you ever get anything and think, oh, I don't want this anymore. Yeah, find a different home for it. Don't release it into the wild. Now I am going to handle this one with a glove, but one of the things I want you to check out is in addition to those parotid or poison glands right behind the eyes there, cane toads, as if they're not already big enough, um, they will inflate their bodies to make themselves look even bigger. So when I bring him out, you'll see him pulling in air and blowing himself up kind of like a big balloon to tell me that he's way too big for me to try to eat and that I should probably put him down, okay? In addition to that, he may release, as I mentioned, toads that are land dwelling, will gather up rainwater and hold it in their bodies so they don't dry out. So in addition to that, he may release that rainwater. Yeah, it looks like urine, but it's really just the water that he's holding in his body. So I'm gonna keep him right over his cage. We'll see if he, how he does. Yeah, he's already kind of inflating himself. <laughs> you can see him sucking in the air. Starting to get, oh, you can see him releasing that, the water. <laughs> so if I wasn't gloved and didn't know better, I would be like, ew, I'm gonna put you down. You lost some more for us, maybe? Oh. <laughs> so that's just a protective strategy that this particular toad has um, in order to, you know, get predators to leave them alone. So all kinds of protection strategies. First one is that very well camouflaged skin. They blend in really well on the forest floor. And then next, of course, they have pretty strong jumping legs to hop away. Now, toads don't do giant leaps like bullfrogs and other frogs do, but they can certainly leap pretty good and pretty fast. And so one of their strategies, if the camouflage isn't first working, is to jump or hop away. Then next, remember those poison glands that releases that toxic, yucky-tasting substance. And then finally with the cane toad, they'll inflate their body. So all kinds of protective strategies. And remember that picture with the eggs? 
they lay a whole bunch of eggs as well in order to survive out there. Animals have a, a tough life, so they've got all kinds of built-in strategies for protection and survival out there. So that's our amphibians, and again, that would include our frogs and our toads and our salamanders. And along with reptiles that we're going to move to now, amphibians are cold-blooded. Now, that doesn't mean that the blood through their body is icy cold or anything like that. It simply means they stay about the same temperature as the environment in which they are. And so as we move to reptiles, our reptiles, we have four main reptile groups. Number one, we've got the ones that have the protective armor on their back, kind of the home that they carry around with them. What are those? Snails. Turtles. Snails is another good guess, but that's a different type of animal. But yeah, turtles, so they have a protective shell there. And then we also have those long, slithery ones, snakes. We have the alligators and crocodiles. And then lastly are lizards. So those are all the reptiles. Those are all the reptiles. Again, we've got snakes, turtles, lizards, the alligators and crocodiles. Those are the main reptiles, okay? So let's see, we're gonna meet a couple of reptiles. The first one, well, this isn't it yet, but that's what reptile eggs look like. Most reptiles do lay eggs. Now, as you recall with our amphibians, they started their life in the water. That's not true with reptiles. All reptiles that lay eggs will lay their eggs on land. So even those sea turtles that live way out in the ocean, those sea turtles come up onto shore, lumber up onto the beach, dig a hole, and lay their eggs. Okay, so most reptiles lay eggs. About half the species of snakes actually give a live birth instead of egg laying. Okay. So here is a box turtle. This is a female or girl. Her head is here. Here is where she has dug a hole and she's laying a nest of eggs. And those little eggs are about this big, so not huge. And then inside that egg is a little baby box turtle. So cute. And look, this is a quarter. So they're not much bigger than the size of a quarter. Now that shell is actually bone, just like the rest of their skeleton. Okay, so that shell is gonna, they're born with it and it's gonna grow with that turtle as it grows up and gets bigger. Now the bones that make up that top shell, it's kind of interesting. I love turtle skeletons. Um, if you feel your ribs, we have 12 ribs on this side and 12 ribs on this side. And our rib bones are kind of long and thin. But imagine those bones flattened out and then fused together. And that's what actually makes up the top part of the turtle shell. This is actually their rib bones here. Is that a real skull? This one's a shell, yeah. Is that a real it one? It is a real one. And then inside that shell, attached to those ribs, is the backbone or the it's spine. It's the spinal cord. It, that's right, it's right here. So a turtle cannot crawl out of its shell and leave its shell behind any more than we could climb out of our backbone, okay? So that spine, shell, and everything is fully integrated into that turtle. Now a box turtle, Gets its name Box, B-O-X, because it can pull everything inside, its arms, its legs, its heads, its tail, and close its shell up tight like a box, okay? And so that provides really good protection for that animal. In fact, a box turtle's number one enemy is a car. Yep. So springtime is especially when turtles are on the move. So if you ever see a turtle in the road and it's safe for you to pull over, simply pull over, pick up the turtle. If it's a box turtle, no problem. They'll probably just close up inside of their shell. And if the turtle is heading in this direction, going in the road, all you need to do is pick it up, put it on this side of the road, whichever direction that's heading in, okay? And then just leave it there. Our box turtle numbers continue to decrease. So we don't want to remove box turtles from the wild or really any wild animal from the wild because that's taken them out of the genetic pool. Okay, and, and then they won't be able to continue that life cycle in the wild. 
Box turtles also have a very, very small home range. Their home range is where they know exactly where to find food, water, shelter, all the things they need in order to survive. And if they're removed from that home range, they get very, very disoriented and often don't do so well after that. So with box turtles especially, you want to just move them to the side of the road in the direction they're facing and then just leave them right there. Let them continue their life out in the wild. Yes? Also um, coyotes are Their coyotes are what? The, the box turtles. Yeah, so, so once it's an adult, so... So the comment is a coyote might be the enemy of a box turtle, and that's true, but once they're an adult, even a coyote's mouth can't really do much to the shell. But particularly when they're little itty bitty babies. Yeah. So particularly when they're babies, um, they have a little bit harder time and certainly more problems with predators when they're little. And in and, and the egg as well. A lot of things will dig up eggs and eat the eggs. Yeah. All right, so we are going to meet a box turtle, and the box turtle happens to be the North Carolina state reptile. So they're pretty special to our state. This one again is a box turtle, not the snapping turtle. If you're moving a snapping turtle out of the road, uh, be really careful with that one because their necks whoop, are like this long. Okay, so they may have it pulled in. Their neck kind of they have this this neck bones that kind of pull in like an S shape. So they can pull their head in, not enclose their shell, but they can pull their head in, but that neck can stretch like way out all the way to almost the back part of the shell. That's on a snapping turtle, okay? So if you're moving a snapping turtle out of the road, be really, really careful. They have very big, strong, powerful jaws and can give quite a nasty bite. Take a picture, Mama. All right. Now, our box turtle, we have about 20 different species or types of turtles that live here in North Carolina. And our box turtle is the only truly terrestrial, again, that's land-dwelling turtle that we have in our state. All the other turtle species that we have here in North Carolina are typically found in and around water, okay? But our box turtle is primarily terrestrial. Now, in the summertime, like on a day like today, a box turtle may take a nice little soak in some shallow water. They're not strong swimmers, so you definitely don't want to rescue, rescue a box turtle and plunk it in a pond. That's not really rescuing the box turtle. So they are land-dwelling turtles. Now, I am going to bring this one around for touching. However, the museum does follow the CDC recommendations, that Centers for Disease Control recommendation that kids under the age of five not touch reptiles. And that would also include anyone with a compromised immune system, including pregnant women as well. And that's because reptiles are known carriers of salmonella. Okay, so if you want your under five, that means if you have a four, three, two, one, zero with you, um, parents or caregivers, please keep your under five-year-old's hands and fingers out of the mouth. Often in what time, what happens with under five-year-olds is they touch, and then those fingers go right into the mouth. Okay, and we just don't want that to happen. Regardless of your age, no matter what age you are, if you choose to touch our reptiles, please keep your fingers away from your face, out of your mouth, out of your nose. And then at the end of the program, we're going to exit over here on your left-hand side and just past our live snake wall are restrooms for washing hands. And I would encourage everyone to go to the restroom, wash hands with soap, water, dry with a paper towel, as hand sanitizer is not as effective as hand washing. So we're going to do a two-finger touch right on his shell, the back part of his shell. If he decides to keep a back leg out, you can touch that back leg or foot, but we're not going to touch in the face or the head, and we're not going to touch his tail either because that tends to be kind of a sensitive place. All right. So we're just looking over here. All right, did everyone touch that wanted to touch? I didn't miss anybody, did I? Okay. All right, so again, our box turtle, Easter box turtle. And 
again, that's our North Carolina state reptiles. So they're pretty common throughout our state. Common meaning they're found throughout our state. But if you ever go in the woods actually looking for a box turtle, they're pretty tricky to find. They're hard to find. And as I mentioned, their numbers are decreasing. So never take a box turtle out of the wild, please. Leave them there so that you know our future generations will have box turtles in the wild to enjoy. All right, so our last animal is another reptile. So again, those reptiles include turtles and snakes, the alligators and crocodiles, and the lizards. So our last animal is a lizard. It's a lizard that's not found here in North Carolina, however. It's one that would be found in Australia and parts of New Guinea. And this is called a blue tongue skink. It's a pretty large lizard. The lizards that we have here in North Carolina tend to be kind of small, tend to be pretty fast. Uh, we do have a broadhead skink like this little uh, model here. And that's one of our larger species right here in our state. Um, of course, we have legless lizards here, which are the glass lizards. They get very long, but not real big body, but no legs on those guys. Um, but this one, again, would be from parts of Australia. And it's called a blue tongue skink because it uses that blue tongue as a defensive strategy. Again, for survival out in the wild. Wait, this way up. Or are you taking a nap back there? Let's see here. So like other reptiles that hatch out of eggs, the eggs are very, very tough and leathery, kind of like a leathery sort of shoe, if you imagine that. So they don't crack like a chicken egg. So the little baby's inside, and you can't see it on this picture here, but they have what's called an egg tooth right on the tip of their snout. And so that little egg tooth is actually a little bit of bone that they, when they're inside their shell, they'll use that egg tooth to scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape until they finally manage to cut a hole or a slit in the egg, and then they're able to hatch out of that egg. That little egg tooth, it's not really a tooth at all. Again, it's a little bit of bone. That will fall off because never again will that animal need the egg tooth for hatching out of an egg. So that's the reptiles, again, that are hatched out of eggs. Have that. Hi, boy. Now this is our last animal, and it is a couple minutes before two, so if you need to scoot out after touching this one, remember, hit the doors over here on your left, run by the restrooms for washing your hands. Now you thank you so much for joining me today, learning a little bit about reptiles and amphibians. Get some of that dirt off of his back. All right. Now, like snakes, lizards also use their tongue for smelling. So you may see his tongue flick out. He's just simply smelling, getting an idea of who and what's out there and if it's anything dangerous. Now, if he were to feel threatened or insecure or a little nervous or scared, if a predator was bothering him, he would stick out that tongue. And remember what our cane toad did with blowing itself up and making itself look really big? These lizards do that as well. So they kind of puff themselves up. And then they display that tongue out really big. On the Hang on. Here's a picture of that blue tongue. And you can see his body, he's flattened and just inflating himself up to look really big and scary. Now I'm going to bring this guy around for touching. Again, you can do a two finger touch right on his back. Again, not near the, the head. And like I said, this is our last animal. So feel free to scoot out if you're ready to do so. If you won't have any questions, feel free to stick around. I cannot around, touch it. I'm just I don't look. You can maybe see that blue tongue if he sticks it out there. Oh, 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 see it. We just did it for you. Yeah. Now you'll notice some holes on the side of his head. Those are his ears. Okay, so he's got ears kind of like we do. We just have a big flappy part on our ears that he doesn't have. <laughs> but that scaly skin, just like all reptiles. I'm so